My name is Melissa DeFore, and I am the OB educator here at North Alabama Medical Center. We wanted to thank you for joining us online for our child birthing class experience. So welcome to Labor Learning and Baby Basics. Let's begin. Today we will be going over some very basic labor learning experiences, what to expect during your birthing process, and how to care for yourself in the postpartum phase and what to expect with that, as well as some basic baby newborn care. Like I said, my name is Melissa DeFour, and I'm the OB educator here at North Alabama Medical Center. I am a Lamaze certified childbirth educator, as well as a certified labor doula. My goal with this childbirth class is to give you lots of information that will hopefully reduce a little bit of your anxiety and help you to feel more comfortable about your birthing experience. So I want you to take just a few seconds and think about the first word that pops in your head when you hear the word birth. So I'll give you guys just a few seconds to write that down. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and guess. Some of you might have written some words that are a little bit on the negative side, as in birth is scary, birth is painful. Uh, birth is terrifying. Those are some of the common words that I have gotten in the past. Um, the whole point of this class is, again, to reduce your anxiety and to help you feel a little bit more comfortable about knowing what's going on and helping you to be able to make good sound decisions for your own patient-centered care. And so my word is birth is empowering, and I think we're all entitled to a sense of empowerment. I think it's completely amazing how our bodies grow this tiny little human, and then our bodies know what to do when it comes time for the birthing experience, and then we know what to do when it comes time to feed our own babies. And so I just think that we are entitled to a sense of empowerment. All right, so we are going to move on. As you all know, if you were here on campus, um, we would be doing a tour of the facility. However, I would ask that you please refer to the website for a virtual tour of our beautiful facility and as well as the Hope Suite. So I just wanted to clarify a few things about the entrance. Uh, the main entrance of the hospital is closed to the public during nighttime hours. We ask that you please use the emergency department entrance between 9.30 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. You don't necessarily have to be seen by the emergency department. You can come straight to labor and delivery as long as it is labor and delivery related. So if you are having any sort of abdominal cramping, uh, bleeding, feel like you have some pressure, you feel like your water is broke, things of that nature, anything baby related, please come and see us in labor and delivery. Here at North Alabama Medical Center, we respect your requests for privacy and want to provide you with a safe environment. We do have a patient privacy request form. This form will allow you to complete information um, and it allows you to give a password. And so if you were to want to make yourself not known to the public that you are here in the hospital, we can develop a password system and anyone that were to ask for you here in the hospital would need to know that password in order for us to provide information as to what room you are in. So if this is something that you are interested in, please just ask for the patient privacy request form. So now we're going to review some common terms that you might hear throughout your birthing experience. The first one is dilatation or dilation. This is meant to describe how open your cervix is. And so the way we do that is whenever we check your cervix, um, if we can fit one finger through the cervix, that's one centimeter dilated. A finger on top of finger is two centimeters dilated. A finger beside finger is three centimeters dilated, so on and so forth. Um, I just want you to know that you cannot push until you get to be at least 10 centimeters dilated and 100% effaced. And we're gonna go over effacement now. So what effacement is, is the gradual thinning or shortening of the cervix. And so if you look to this picture on the left here, you will see that this cervix is 0% effaced. It is not thinned out. The picture in the middle is 50% effaced, and the picture on the right is 100% effaced. 
So again, you're going to want that cervix to be 10 centimeters dilated and 100% effaced before we ever begin the pushing process. The next thing we're going to discuss is fetal station, and this is where the baby is lying within the pelvis. And so how we measure that is once the baby's head is even with these two ischial spines here of the pelvis, that is a zero station. Anything below that station is going to be a positive station, so plus one, two, three, plus four. Um, once you're plus four, uh, this is the time, you know, we're probably going to begin pushing if we haven't already. Uh, but baby is at the outlet, which means we're um, hopefully going to be able to see that baby's head. Anything above that zero station is going to be a negative station. So minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. Um, sometimes you might hear us refer to it as floating, and that just means the baby is up so high they're not engaged. Their head moves when we touch it. Another thing we're going to talk about is fetal presentation. The two most common presentations are breech and vertex. We want our babies to be in the vertex presentation, and that just means that the baby is head down. A breech presentation is going to mean that the baby is turned the wrong way. So that might present as butt down, feet down, knees down, things of that nature. But basically their head is at the top and their you know, lower end is at the bottom. If your baby is in the breech presentation, that will likely be an indication for a cesarean section. Some other common terms that you might hear is episiotomy and laceration. Episiotomy is a surgical incision made in the perineum uh, that allows for extended room for the baby. Uh, if we do not do an episiotomy and we allow natural tearing, um, what could happen is the mom might experience a laceration, and that would just be where the perineum uh, tears on its own. Meconium is the baby's first bowel movement, and sometimes babies will have, um, they will pass the meconium in utero. How you're going to know that is if your water breaks, it's going to be anything but clear. So it might be a little yellow stained, green, it might even look like pea soup. Um, so please make note of that if your water breaks and it's anything but clear, you need to come on to the hospital and let us know what time it happened and what color it was. Um, <clears throat> and that way we can be prepared for extra measures at delivery to prevent the neonate from aspirating that meconium. Uh, Cytotec and Pitocin are two medications that we can give in order to induce or augment labor. Cytotec is a pill that we give, and typically we will uh, cut this pill up into smaller portions and give it over time, depending on the orders. Pitocin is through your IV, and we can increase or decrease the rate depending on how we want that contraction pattern to look. Um, and then we can also give these two medications post-delivery um, to help prevent postpartum hemorrhage. The placenta is uh, basically the organ that attaches to the uterus that allows the transfer of maternal blood to the neonate in order to help that baby grow, provide nutrients and oxygen for that baby. The fundus is the very uh, top of the uterus. And so what you may have heard now throughout your prenatal visits is they're measuring the fundal height. Uh, so typically at about 20 weeks, the top of your uterus, which is known as the fundus, should be at uh, the level of the umbilicus um, and progress from there. Uh, the fundus is important in labor because this is where we are going to find um, our strongest point of our contraction. Um, and then post-delivery, we will be doing what's called fundal massaging. And basically it is uh, where your nurse finds the top of the fundus or the top of the uterus and we are going to be evaluating that uterus and that fundus to make sure it's nice and firm, uh, that it's not boggy or squishy, uh, which is what that term means. And then also um, making sure it's contracting down like it's supposed to and that our bleeding is minimal. Preterm is going to be anything less than 37 weeks. Uh, GBS is something that you guys are going to be swabbed for at around 36 weeks of gestation. Um, some women are positive for GBS and some women are negative. However, if you are positive, uh, we will be administering antibiotics throughout the course of the labor process um, in order to prophylactically prevent an infection for that baby whenever they're delivered. 
An NST stands for a non-stress test, and that is just to bring you in, hook you up to our fetal monitoring system, and just evaluate the well-being of, of your baby. Just seeing how that baby is doing in utero without any stress. Um, hopefully these will take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. Sometimes they can be extended longer than that, just depending on um, what we see on the monitor. Um, a cesarean section is a surgical procedure in which we uh, birth the baby through the abdomen. And uh, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. And then Braxton Hicks are um, what I like to call warm-up contractions. And um, these are, you know, contractions or cramping you may experience throughout the pregnancy um, that is not going to change your cervix. Now we're gonna move on to fetal monitoring. So this is how we are going to evaluate how your baby is doing in utero. The first type of fetal monitoring systems that we have are the external fetal monitors. And those are placed on the abdomen. We have what's called a TOCO transducer. And that will allow us um, to see any kind of uterine activity that's going on. So when you have a contraction, when that contraction ends, how far apart they are, things like that. The one on the bottom, or is typically placed on the bottom of the abdomen right here, is the ultrasound transducer. And this is the one that is going to allow us to be able to look at the baby's heart rate and just make sure the baby is doing good in there. The other type of monitoring system that we have are called internal monitors. Um, these can only be placed if your water has broken. The first one is called a spiral electrode, and this one is placed on the baby's head, and this allows us to get a very accurate reading of the baby's heart rate. So if we're having a really hard time picking up the baby's heart rate, uh, we might have to do a spiral electrode. Um, or if we can't tell if it's mama's heart rate or baby's heart rate, we, we might have to place one then as well. The other internal monitor is called an intrauterine pressure catheter. And um, you can see it here. Uh, this is placed uh, within the uterus and it's called an IUPC. And this is what's gonna measure our uterine activity. This intrauterine pressure catheter will let us know exactly when that contraction starts, exactly how uh, firm that contraction is getting and when that contraction falls away. The third type of monitoring system we have is called the Novi. And I love the Novi. This, this is a Bluetooth monitoring system. It works via electrode patches uh, placed upon the abdomen. It is waterproof. It is great for anyone who's wanting to do natural birth experience. Uh, you can get up, you can move around, you can do hydrotherapy. Uh, the only time it doesn't work is submerged underwater. And so, you know, if we were to need a fetal heart rate tracing, uh, we would just ask that you, you know, get up out of the water for just a little bit and let us get um, a strip on the baby. As the baby progresses down the pelvis, the bottom um, <clears throat> electrode can be moved down uh, to help keep up with the baby within the uterus. So those are our three types of monitoring systems that we have to see how baby is doing in utero. So now we're going to talk about visitors. While you're an outpatient here at North Alabama Medical Center, typically that's called the triage, and we do allow one visitor to accompany you during your visit. There are some very personal questions that we do have to ask all clients um, upon admission to either labor and delivery or to the triage outpatient area uh, that we would ask all visitors stay in the lobby until we get those questions asked. After we have completed with that question air, um, if you are an outpatient, you may have one visitor to accompany you in the triage area. That um, visitor will be given a visitor badge and that will allow them access in and out of that area um, as they need to. Once uh, the client is discharged from triage, that visitor access badge will be, need to be turned into the nurse's station. While you're in labor or pre-cesarean section, uh, three visitors may accompany you during the labor process. Um, we will give three visitor badges out. However, if you plan on having um, other visitors come and go, they would then need to take that visitor badge off 
pass it to the next person, that person then can come into your room as well. So it's kind of like their ticket into your room. During the delivery process itself or the birthing experience, um, you are allowed three visitors in during that time as well. Any doula or photographer is considered one of your three visitors. Um, if anyone were to want to rotate out, that's typically not the time that we do that, uh, just because we'll be doing the birthing experience itself and you know, we don't really want a rotation of people coming in and out during that time. So whoever is going to be in there for the birthing experience needs to be the three people that have the badge. Um, during the epidural placement, we ask that all visitors remain in the waiting room during that time. Uh, if you do require a cesarean section for the birth of your baby, uh, we do allow one visitor to accompany you into the operating room. And so if you would just let us know who that is, that person would receive a badge to get into the operating room, um, as well as um, clothing that would be necessary to enter that area. Uh, during your postpartum phase or your post-birthing phase, uh, there um, is no limitation to the amount of visitors once you are in your postpartum room. Um, so that would be different during your recovery phase. During your recovery phase, um, typically we allow up to three visitors um, unless it is a cesarean section and then visitors may be reduced from there. All right, so we are going to move on and talk about false labor versus true labor. So false labor, the thing that you might experience is called Braxton Hicks contractions. A lot of times these are often painless. Uh, they may be irregular. You might have one here. You might not have another one uh, for several hours or even days. Um, most people say that it feels like a balling up sensation. Uh, typically, these Braxton Hicks contractions will go away with rest or lying down. So, you know, if you are out and about, you're walking um, and you sit down and rest for a little bit, those Braxton Hicks contractions should go away. Uh, these Braxton Hicks contractions will not change your cervix. Uh, if they are, however, becoming more frequent or feeling like they're getting a lot more intense or painful, this may be uh, true labor or regular contractions. Um, <clears throat> you're going to potentially experience some discomfort in the back or lower abdomen or even both. Uh, these contractions are going to continue whether you rest or walk, um, so they're going to just keep going. And these contractions will actually change your cervix and cause that cervix to start thinning out and dilate. So now we're going to talk about some maternal positioning during the labor process. Um, <clears throat> if you have an epidural, most of the time you want to be uh, side lying, so either at a left tilt or all the way on your left side or at a right tilt or all the way on your right side. Um, you can also get placed into the knee chest position uh, during labor as well, even with an epidural. If you don't have an epidural, maternal positioning is really just up to you um, and dependent on your physician and what you guys have talked about during your birthing plan. Uh, but you should be able to, you know, move around, uh, get on the birthing ball, things like that. The only thing that we ask is that you never lay flat on your back. All right, snacks for labor. So what can you have during the labor process? Um, we've got all the ice chips and popsicles that you could ever want. Um, basically, ice chips, popsicles, and hard candy only. Uh, the only thing that we don't provide for you is hard candy. Uh, so that would be peppermints, Jolly Ranchers, basically anything that doesn't have a soft center. So for instance, say you get a sucker, make sure that you um, you know, don't get like a Tootsie Roll pop because once you get to the Tootsie Roll, you got to throw it away. And let's face it, nobody wants to do that. So make sure it's something that is hard all the way through, like a Dum Dum, things like that. Okay, so what to pack? Um, we ask that you please do not bring any outside linen into our facility. We will provide you with all the sheets, blankets, pillows, and gowns that you could ever want. Um, breastfeeding, if you plan on breastfeeding, it would be um, good to bring like a nursing bra or nursing pads. 
Uh, if you plan on bottle feeding, uh, we suggest that you bring a sports bra. Um, all your toiletries, so shampoo, conditioner, uh, body wash, soap, toothpaste, toothbrush, those things, uh, make sure you bring those as well. If you want to have footprints um, to be placed in your baby book, make sure you bring your baby book and we'll be glad to do that for you. Uh, Butler Studios offers newborn photography here. You are welcome to bring outfits for those photographs or they provide um, swaddle blankets and things like that for you as well. Uh, if you plan on having another facility come in, uh, then make sure that you just bring outfits for those photographs. It is very important to know that you have to have a car seat to leave with your baby. Uh, so please make sure that you bring a car seat that's not out of date um, and an outfit to go home in and one receiving blanket. The next thing that we're gonna discuss is developing a birthing plan. Here at North Alabama Medical Center, we really want to know what you want out of your labor and um, birth experience. And so what we like to say is um, go home. If you have a doula, discuss it with them as well. Uh, but really just sit down, you and your partner or your support person, and write out a couple of bulleted points of what you hope to experience during your labor process. Um, so say, for instance, you know I want these people in room during my birth experience. Um, you might want to include that on there. If you want to try all natural labor, you need to include that in there as well. Um, so basically, you just sit down and think about lots of different options. Um, I know the bump.com used to have a great uh, birthing plans where you just kind of click some check boxes and it printed it out for you. Um, please make sure, because some of those options we do not offer here at our facility, uh, so please make sure you discuss all of those options with your physician. Bring a copy with you um, whenever you come in to be admitted, because our nurses will, will take that birthing plan and we review it, we place a copy on the chart. If there's anything pertaining to baby, so you want to do skin to skin right after delivery and attempt to breastfeed, um, all of those things need to be included because we do send a copy to the nursery as well. Please know that we are so excited about your birthing plans. And um, in the event, though, that anything were to compromise yours or the baby's well-being, we might have to alter that birthing plan just ever so slightly. And that would only be for the safety of you and your baby. Our number one goal here at North Alabama Medical Center is healthy mom, healthy baby. Uh, but please bring your birthing plans in. We love to discuss them with you. Please discuss it with your physician and let us know when you get here so we can place a copy on your chart. So now we're gonna talk about methods of pain control. So some of these methods can be breathing techniques, relaxation methods, massage therapy, support from your partner, your support person, or your doula, or even your nurse. Um, doulas are also another great way to help control pain. And then as uh, focal points as well. We're going to go over each of these topics here in just a second. So the first one is massage. So it's very important to um, hit those good pressure points in the palm of your hand or the bottom of your feet. And um, we want it to be like nice and long, slow motions. Uh, those typically are very relaxing and really help women uh, to cope with that pain, kind of trick your brain into thinking that you're not in pain. Um, so massage therapy is great. Another great thing about massage therapy is doing a back massage. And so uh, positions like knee chest or hands and knees or even on the birthing ball, those are great positions for someone to be behind you, whether it be your support person, your doula or your nurse, uh, to be doing some back massage, typically in the lower back region. You can use your fingers. You can get a tennis ball and, and rub it in the back that way. Uh, you can actually take a Coke can, and I like to hold it like this, and then rub up and down the lower portion of the back. That really, really helps, puts a lot of great counter pressure on that back to help with some of that back labor pain as well. 
The next one is support from your nurses and doulas. We try to maintain um, one nurse to one patient ratio. And uh, so we are constantly here for you. We are here to support you, get you into some different positions that may help with labor process. Um, if you have a doula, they are a great resource um, to help you with the, the labor experience and to help, you know, kind of change it up and, and get rid of uh, those feelings of pain that may start to occur. So um, if you are interested, there are several doulas in our area that would, would love to take care of you. Um, we do have several nurses that have been through doula training. Um, there are two of us who are certified as well. So just know that we do have um, some doula training and certifications actually here in, in staffing as well. Focal points. So it's very important to focus on something during labor. Um, <clears throat> I tried the natural labor process and I thought I was, okay, I'm going to look at something this entire time and it ended up being the back of my eyelids. So, um, you know, it's whatever works for you. Me, for my focal point, I had to close my eyes. I just concentrated on closing my eyes and breathing through those contractions, changing up my positioning. Um, so, you know, a focal point to you may be a spot on the wall. It may be a person. It may be your support person. Uh, you know, it may be a poster. You know, you could bring in a, a poster of superheroes and be like, okay, Wonder Woman, we got this, you know. Um, and so it could just be a favorite object from home that you really like to look at. So whatever your focal point may be, look at that object, focus on it. Um, and make sure you're controlling your breathing throughout, throughout those contractions, and that will really, really help reduce that pain level. Breathing techniques. This is so important. I cannot stress this enough. You will not get through contractions if you cannot breathe well. Um, you know, they are painful, but if we can take a second to breathe and get through that pain, um, it actually doesn't hurt as bad. So different breathing techniques are going to be long, deep breathing. So that would be in your nose and out your mouth. So we can all practice that together. And that's going to be in. Fill up your lungs nice and big and blow out. Okay. When you get to the peak of your contraction, that's when the pain is the most intense. And so what you would then need to do is probably breathe a little faster, but not so fast that you hyperventilate. Um, so what that kind of would probably look like is in your nose and out your mouth like this. So you can see I'm filling up my lungs nice and big, um, but they're just coming a little bit quicker, but not too fast, okay? As that contraction starts to fall away and that pain starts to decrease, your breathing needs to slow down. Once that contraction ends, you need to take one big final cleansing breath. So again, in your nose and out your mouth. Contractions can last anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds. I've seen them be shorter. I've seen them be lots longer. And so it's very important to know when you're hitting that peak, knowing how to control your breathing. Another option for breathing is um, the he he who method. And I will say that when I first started teaching this, I had never um, experienced labor for myself. And so I always told my class that, you know, I don't particularly like the he he who, but if you want a he he who, I will he he who with you all day long. And this is the typical that you see in every standard Hollywood movie ever invented about labor and delivery. Um, and it's, and I will tell you, you sound silly doing it, okay? But it works, all right? It is the best breathing technique that I found. I thought I could deep breathe throughout my labor experience and I just kind of threw that out the window. I said, okay, we're gonna hee hee hoo. So I want everyone to try that with me. All right, so again, when you hit the peak of your contraction, that's gonna be a little bit faster. It's gonna sound a little something like this. So try it with me. 
All right. And then the next one is um, if you're trying to allow that perineum to stretch out a little more to avoid pushing uh, before it's time, uh, there is one called the feather blow method. And that is when we pretend like we're blowing a feather across the table. Okay. And it's like this. Okay. So I want everyone to try that. All right, so you can see there's no way that you could bear down and push if you're if you're breathing like that. Okay, so again, that allows time for that perineum to stretch, hopefully avoid any kind of lacerations. Or if you're just not quite 10 centimeters dilated, but feeling that super urge to push, that will help with that as well. All right, so we're going to move on. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the most important, and that is get moving. I cannot stress enough that it is so uncomfortable to labor in the bed, okay? Um, so typically, you would need to talk with your physician about um, how frequently you might be monitored, if the Novi is an option for you so that we can get that good continuous monitoring. And so I say get moving as in get up walk around, um, you know, walk around your room, walk in, up and down the hall. We have birthing balls that are great. Get on those, move around. Um, there's one that I call the fifth grade dance move. It's where you grab a hold of your partner and you rock back and forth like you're dancing in fifth grade, okay? Um, that allows nice room for someone to massage your back, um, but it gets you moving. It helps get that pelvis opened up. Um, we have a squatting bar that we can put on your bed. So lots and lots of different wonderful options. Um, we do have two hooks in our Hope Suite that allow for a birthing swing. Um, so great options that we have here. I suggest highly to get moving. Talk with your physician about options as far as monitoring goes and what you can and can't do during your labor process. Um, but it, it's not fun to lay in bed. It doesn't feel good. Um, I suggest getting up, moving around as much as possible as you can because that's really going to help work that baby down and it really helps take the, your mind off all that pain. So now we're going to move on to alternative methods for pain control. And these are going to be pharmacological methods such as an epidural placement or IV pain medication. What we have here is called Stadol. Um, and it is IV pain medication that we can give you during the labor process to help with the pain. Just know that once you reach seven centimeters, we can no longer give that IV pain medication because what affects mama affects baby, and we don't want to deliver babies that are real sleepy from that pain medication. So let's talk about what's going to happen when you get here. Immediately upon admission, you're going to have what's called admission labs drawn. And this is where we check your blood levels um, to kind of get a baseline of what's going on with you prior to, de prior to the birth of your baby. We are going to um, do a type and screen of your blood just in the event that we have to give you blood or blood products. We want to know what your blood type is um, before you birth your baby. And then we also obtain an IV access for um, allowing us to give medications, give fluids, or give blood in the event of an emergency. So everyone will get an IV access. All right, so let's talk about stages of labor. Um, the first stage of labor is broken down into three phases. You have early, active, and transition. Early is gonna be one to three centimeters. This is usually the longest. Um, most of the time it's not very painful, and a lot of times women don't even realize that they're in this stage of labor. And so um, a lot of times what you'll see is people start the nesting, uh, they get their house nice and clean, uh, they may have a little bit of cramping, but they're not really sure. But a lot of times women don't even realize they're in this stage of labor. All right, active stage of labor. And so this is when things start getting a little more difficult. Um, this is from four centimeters to seven centimeters. Um, and this is when you're going to want to start thinking about ways to control pain. Um, breathing techniques are great. Um, 
And then you also might have a little bit of what's called normal show. And this is when that cervix is starting to break down and get thinner. Um, you might have a little bit of bloody show um, that you will notice throughout the labor process. And just know that that is okay. Um, however, any sudden gushes of bright red blood or your soaking pads, uh, you would, if you're not already at the hospital, you would need to come on into our facility and let us check you out. Typically, you can kind of count on once you reach five centimeters that the cervix will usually di dilate about a centimeter an hour from there. Now, this is not the case for every single person. Some may go much quicker than that, and some people may take hours upon hours later, okay? Um, so this is just kind of a guesstimation, just standard once you reach five. It's about a centimeter an hour from there. At this time, if your water has not broken, your physician may choose to um, break the bag of waters for you by using an amni hook, and here is a picture of that as well. They'll do a cervical exam, um, and then this little hook will uh, break the bag of waters. It's almost kind of like um, rupturing a water balloon, okay? Um, it might be a little uncomfortable, but it should not be painful, and so that's called rupture of membranes. Active phase of that first stage of labor is typically when you're going to want to think about pain management control. And so it could be that you want to do all natural and use the breathing and massage techniques and moving around. Um, it's up to you what type of pain management control you want to use. Again, please note that IV pain medication cannot be given to you after you've reached seven centimeters in dilation. If you choose to get the epidural, please know that we do have to give you a bolus of fluid and um, get any needed staff onto our facility if they are not already here in order to get that epidural placed. Uh, this can take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, so please, if you are planning to get an epidural, notify us in advance so that we can get all of these things set up for you. All right, so let's talk a little more about epidural. So um, epidurals are great. They help manage pain throughout the labor process and throughout um, the delivery and birth of your baby. It will usually block at least 80% of the pain. Uh, you are going to be getting a constant dose through your pump. Uh, so once they um, place this catheter into the epidural space, they will uh, then put that catheter and attach it to a pump and that will slowly deliver medication through that pump. Um, Epidurals work by gravity, so say for instance you're laying on your left side and your right side starts hurting a little bit, we are going to rotate you to that right side and let um, some of that dosing get to that right side. However, if that position change does not work, you will have a little button that you can press and that's going to help deliver an extra dose to you. Um, if that is still not working, we will notify the nurse anesthetist and they will come in and potentially change out medications, look to see if the epidural um, catheter is still intact, and if not, um, it could potentially have to be replaced. But usually the extra doses, the position changing, all of those usually will help to alleviate whatever pain you may experience. Um, some people are able to move their legs, um, but just know that we will be turning you ever so often to make sure we get a good, even balanced dosage on each side. The reason we only block about 80% of that pain is because we want you to be able to feel that pressure down low and so that you can push effectively. Um, and so that is why we don't typically block all of the pain. We just block the 80% of it so that you are able to push. So once you get the epidural, we will place a Foley catheter in your bladder. We do that for several different reasons. One, when you have the epidural, you're probably not even going to be able to feel that you have to go to the bathroom. And so we would um, place that catheter for that. Also, it helps to keep that bladder nice and empty, so it allows more room for that baby to move down in through the pelvis and prevent any kind of damage to the bladder that would have occurred. All right, so moving on, we are now approaching transition. Transition is gonna be from eight to uh, 10 centimeters, and this is the last phase of the first stage of labor. This is oftentimes the hardest. Um, it may go very quickly. Um, it's very intense, maybe even emotional for mamas. Um, you know, 
mamas get really focused in this transition phase. And so it's very important for support people, whether that be a supportive partner, a mama, a doula, you need to be there for them at this stage, um, help support them through that transition and then on into the pushing stage, which we're gonna talk about now. So the second stage of labor is known as the pushing stage. Um, this stage may last from one contraction up to two to three hours. Um, just know if you are a first time mama, a typical is about one to two hours of pushing. Uh, before you get to this stage, it is so important to rest as much as you can because pushing stage is hard, hard work, okay? So it's very important that you rest if you can. When we start pushing, your uh, nurse is going to remove that catheter out of the way. Um, they will help place you in the appropriate position of your choice. So if you have an epidur epidural, typical positioning is lithotomy or side lying. Um, if you don't have an epidural, that is going to be according to whatever you and your physician have discussed. Um, there's lots of different positions for pushing. Uh, we can do squatting. We can do knee chest. We can do lithotomy. We can do side lying. Um, all sorts of different things. Um, I have seen people, you know, standing in the bed and then they go to squat to push. So just know that we have um, birthing stools and things of that nature to help you if you need any kind of assistance. We have the birthing bar we can attach to the bed. And so again, um, delivery position is going to be something that you would need to discuss with your physician. Um, our uh, nurses or techs are going to set up a sterile delivery table. It will have a blue drape on it. We just ask that you please advise any uh, visiting members in the room to not touch anything that's on the blue drape and to stay at least six feet away from that blue table. Um, we will also be setting up uh, what's called a stabilette. This is a radiant warmer for the baby um, so that we can do all of our drying, measuring, things like that. Um, Occasionally, as long as baby is doing good, we can do most of those things right there skin to skin with mama. Um, so, you know, just know that that is an option that we will have available should your baby need it. All right, so this is the big event. This is what we've been waiting for. So support people, please be there for that, for that mama. She might need ice chips. Her mouth might get really dry while she's pushing. She may want a wet washcloth. I mean, we get hot. It's hard work. Um, you might request a fan. Uh, we can provide those uh, for you if you need it. Again, mouth might get really dry. She might need some lip balm, so be there with some chat stick ready to go. Um, and just in general, just being very supportive for her and in, in during this time of the pushing phase. All right, so let's talk about delivery. First of all, this picture is of me and my baby. Y'all, she's just precious. There is nothing like it in the whole entire world. It's such a magical experience. During the delivery stage, uh, just basically be there, be present, listen to what your nurse and your doctor is telling you to do. There may be a time where as the baby's head is coming out, they might instruct you to push harder. They might instruct you to not push as hard. Um, so really just listen to them during that time. Uh, because they are helping to have a good, smooth birthing experience for you and your baby. Uh, once your baby is all the way out, that is the time that is going to be recorded for delivery. Um, at this time, you or your support people can take pictures, um, video, whatever you need to do. We really, really, really encourage skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, so this is a great time for that. If you or your support person want to cut the cord, your physician will ask you to do so. Here's just a picture of them cutting a cord and what that looks like. Um, and, you know, you can do it if your support person doesn't want to. So that is an option as well. At the time of delivery, um, a nurse is going to draw, measure, and weigh your baby. Um, it's a great time to then do some skin to skin. This is the best way to promote thermoregulation for your baby. Our bodies are awesome. They know how to heat up, to heat our babies up, and I just think it's the coolest thing ever. So really, really, really try to do some skin to skin, and that is bare baby skin to your bare skin. This also will help to create a wonderful bonding experience between you and your baby. 
um, as well as promoting good breastfeeding. Okay, so the third stage of labor, this is the delivery of the placenta. Sometimes you may or may not have to push a little bit. Um, you just listen to your physician, they're gonna let you know what to do. Um, at this time, we do give Pitocin through your um, IV access, and that is just gonna help keep your uterus nice and firm and prevent any kind of postpartum bleeding. <clears throat> your IV is gonna be removed after recovery when your physician gives the order. Okay, so we have made it. We are now in the recovery and postpartum stage of labor. So recovery, you will be um, in recovery for about two hours um, or maybe even longer depending on um, your condition after delivery. Typically we will uh, keep you in labor and delivery in that room for up to two hours. During this time, the nurse is gonna massage your uterus every 15 minutes. So uh, women are at most risk for postpartum hemorrhage within the first two hours after delivery. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna massage that uterus every 15 minutes just to make sure it's nice and firm, that it's not squishy, we don't want it to be boggy, um, and that our bleeding looks good, okay? Um, so again, every 15 minutes we'll be doing that fundal massage. I don't know who named it that, doesn't feel like a massage, it's a little uncomfortable. Um, but we will be doing that, and that is only to just make sure that you are doing well and that we don't have any bleeding going on that's, that is excessive. So once you deliver, we've gone through our two-hour recovery. Uh, what we're going to do is we have a lullaby button uh, as you transition from your labor and delivery room to your postpartum room that you can play, and it just lets the entire hospital know that your sweet little nugget has been born. And so um, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, it's great music therapy for the rest of the hospital because everybody is always like, oh, a baby. So um, please um, make use of that little by button and press it on your way out. If you have um, other children and they wanna press it, please by all means let them. Um, we think it's just wonderful and it lets everyone in the hospital know that your sweet little precious baby has been born. Okay, so now we're going to move on to breastfeeding. The best time to breastfeed initially is right after delivery. Those babies are nice and awake and alert, um, and they are just ready to just take on the world. And so right after delivery, babies get a big old bol bolus of colostrum. And colostrum is just that initial um, period of breast milk that is just jam-packed full of great nutrients, it's very concentrated, so there's not a lot of it, but you gotta remember their bellies are like the size of a marble, okay? They don't need a lot, um, and that's why it's jam-packed with all that good stuff. Um, later feedings of, so the first bolus is about 20 mLs. Later feedings um, are around a tablespoon. And um, so it's very important, try to initiate that first feed. Let's get baby skin to skin um, and trying to breastfeed. Breastfeeding comes with a wealth of benefits for you and baby. Highly recommend taking our breastfeeding course. Um, it is wonderful and um, it will just help you with all sorts of positioning, knowing the benefits for baby. Um, know that we do have a lactation consultant here um, on staff and she is ready and willing to help you guys whenever you deliver. So please, please, please take advantage of that. We have wonderful nursery nurses as well that can also help you if she is unavailable. So please, please, please try to breastfeed. It is excellent. It's a great source of nutrition for your baby. Um, and it's, it's wonderful for mamas as well. When mamas are breastfeeding and skin to skin, we release um, a hormone called oxytocin. And this hormone helps our uterus to contract and helps it to involute back down to its pre-pregnancy size and significantly reduces the risk of postpartum hemorrhage and bleeding. So we call it the hormone of love. So again, just one of the many benefits of breastfeeding and skin to skin. And just as a reminder, we do have a breastfeeding class and a lactation consultant available should you need one. 
All right, so we're going to kind of switch gears just a little bit. Um, in the event of the chance that you have to have a cesarean section, these are some reasons that a cesarean section might be indicated. So if your baby is in a breech presentation, if, you, if your baby has cephalopelvic disproportion, and that just means baby's head is larger than your pelvic opening, um, if you have what's called a cord prolapse, and that just means the baby's cord comes out before the baby. Um, if you have diabetes and have a large baby, or what we call a macrosomic baby, um, these babies might not fit through the pelvis, and if they do, they there might be um, an indication that they could get stuck at their shoulder level. Um, any kind of toxemia, arrest of labor, failure to progress, fetal intolerance to labor, or any active genital herpes. These would all be indications for a cesarean section. This is just a picture of um, some different breech presentations. So again, the baby is just basically turned the wrong way. Um, and we, we deliver head down vaginally. So anything other than that would need to be a cesarean section. So what are we going to do to prepare? pair for a c-section so if you have an epidural in place that will just stay in if you do not um, most likely we will be doing what's called a spinal block um, and that is where we numb the area from uh, the upper abdomen down uh, we will do a clipper prep um, in the pubic area and it will just be a small section uh, your catheter will remain in place if you already have one. If not, we will be inserting one. And then also SCDs, which are sequential compression devices. And what these do is they uh, just wrap around your calf muscle, and they're attached to a machine that will fill up with air, and it gives your leg a nice big old squeeze. And that just helps keep that blood flowing um, through your legs to prevent blood clots. All right, so your cesarean section recovery. Um, typically, we, we try to limit cesarean recovery to two visitors at a time um, as permitted by your nurse, so as long as you're stable. This is also an excellent time to breastfeed. Um, so as soon as we get you back into the room, we immediately bring baby in so that we can do some skin-to-skin -skin and breastfeeding. Uh, we'll do that same fundal massage just as in a vaginal delivery, and we're going to be doing fundal massage and assessing your bleeding every 15 minutes. This recovery is also usually two hours. Uh, we do typically keep your catheter in place, however, until you are done with bed rest, which is about six hours from then. Um, I like to tell everyone, the more you move, the better. Um, so, you know, when you can, try to move around in the bed. Um, once your bed rest is up, kind of make it your goal to be able to get up, walk to the bathroom um, with a nurse. Um, and then eventually, you know, when you're able to get up and move around your room on your own, um, just kind of make it your goal to be able to walk all the way down to the nursery and back without assistance. Um, it may be very uncomfortable to move, uh, but I promise you, if you don't move, um, it's going to be worse in the long run. So the, the more you move, the better. Uh, take baby steps with it, but, but take them. Okay, so make sure you're moving a little bit. The usual stay for delivery, so for a vaginal delivery, is typically about 48 hours from the time of delivery. And for a C-section, it can be anywhere um, from three to four days from the time of delivery. Okay, so now we're in the postpartum phase. And so we have now made the transition into your postpartum room. Um, a few things that I want you to to remember are the first two times that you get up to go to the bathroom, please, please, please call a nurse to assist you. Uh, we do this for a couple of reasons. One, we need to measure your urine. And two, if you've had an epidural um, or even a cesarean section, you may feel like you can walk and move your legs and everything. And then the second you stand up, you look like Bambi trying to walk for the first time. Okay, so please call us. We don't want to, you know, have a, you fall and have a broke arm and then trying to care for a newborn. Um, so please just give us a call. We will assist you to the bathroom and again, like I said, we do need to measure your urine. So this is called a urine hat and we place this in your toilet. And so what you'll do is you'll urinate in here and then we are able to measure it in milliliters. Okay. Um, and so we just want to make sure you've got great urinary output and also again to assist you to the bathroom. 
We're also going to um, help to educate you about postpartum uh, peri care. And so one of the things that we want you to do is to utilize what's called a peri care bottle. Okay. And so every one of you will get one of these. You'll fill this up with warm water. Um, after you urinate or have a bowel movement, you want to take this and spray down there with that warm water. Okay. What that's going to do is rinse everything off, get it nice and clean, and then you want to just pat dry. Okay. Especially if you've got an episiotomy site or a laceration that's been repaired. Um, you've got some stitching going on down there. Padding dry is the, is the way to go, okay? Um, so that's the Peri Care bottle. After that, your next best friend, especially if you have um, hemorrhoids or an episiotomy or a laceration, is going to be what's called Dermaplast, okay? And this is just a numbing spray. And so after you've padded dry, you're going to take this Dermaplast and spray away, okay? Um, where do the whys? Don't hold your mouth while you're spraying. Don't hold it open um, because the mist can actually cause your tongue to go numb. That has happened to me before. Um, so make sure that when you're spraying, you're not talking, okay? If you have an episiotomy or a hemorrhoids, we also have tux pads. Typically, you um, think to use these with your hemorrhoids. However, they really are beneficial on your episiotomy side as well. They contain witch hazel. Um, it's very soothing. And so I would just take two. Tuck one up by your hemorrhoids and tuck one up um, at your episiotomy side as well. Your next best friend is going to be ice packs. Ice packs, ice packs, ice packs for 24 hours, okay? Um, you can change these out every two to four hours because they will um, kind of lose their coldness after that. Um, but it looks like this, okay? There's a green side and a white side. You're going to press it in the center. It will pop or you can fold it down in half like so and it will activate that uh, mechanism in there. That solution will mix together and it will instantly become cold, okay? Um, don't let this freak you out. These are not very absorbent. So one drop of blood hits this, it's going to look like it's taking up most of the pad. Um, so you would need to wear pads underneath it. And so these are what your pads look like there, giant. Um, you actually will put two together for the first little bit. Um, so you would put one under here and then another one here, okay? And then you're going to lay both of those down into what I call your Victoria's Secret Eat Your Heart Out panties. These are mesh. There's one, one size fits all. And the best part about them is when you get them dirty, you throw them away. Okay. I promise you, you'll love these. I wanted to take like tons of pairs home with me, but you know, I couldn't, but um, they are excellent and you will love them. So these are the mesh panties that you will get. Um, the other thing that uh, you want to do is after 24 hours, you want to switch to heat if you've had an episiotomy, laceration, or hemorrhoids. And the way we do that is via sits bath. Okay, so this just goes on your toilet. The instructions are here. You're going to fill this up with warm water. And basically, when you unclamp it, it sends a nice shooting spray over your bottom. Okay, that helps to promote healing. Um, so you would want to do that after the 24-hour mark. So do your ice packs for the first 24 hours and then switch to that um, sits bath there. Um, the first day postpartum, we are going to draw some lab work on you, okay? And that is just to check and see where our levels are um, after delivery in comparison to your baseline. And so that would be another thing that we would do postpartum as well. So basically, I've just gone over the postpartum bag of goodies with you. Um, after you arrive to the postpartum area, you're going to be assessed by a nurse. Um, at this time, you can eat or drink whatever you like as long as, you know, everything is okay. Um, again, please, please, please call, don't fall. Let our nurses help you up to the bathroom for the first two times that you have to go, okay? All right, so we're going to move on to newborn nursery care. So when your baby is born, your baby is going to get what's called an APGAR score. And this APGAR score is based on five criteria, and that's going to be reflex irritability, heart rate, respirations, tone, and color. Each one of those five categories is worth two points for a total of 10, okay? What most people get counted off for is what we call acrocyanosis, and this is just a blue discoloration of the hands and the feet, um, and typically that will go away in about 24 to 48 hours. But that's typically what everyone gets counted off for is that color. Um, 
just know that anything less than a seven on an APGAR, we might have to do a little bit of intervention for the baby, whether it be oxygen, extra stimulation, things of that nature. Once we've assessed the baby and get um, the APGAR scores, we will then give the baby what's called vitamin K injection. Um, this is typically given within the first hour of life. Uh, this is going to be given to help promote blood clotting. It is a shot in the leg. Uh, this is not a vaccine. Uh, we do have preservative-free vitamin K here at our facility. And um, just know that if you are having a male, you have to have vitamin K injection before you get him circumcised. And this is just a picture of uh, the vitamin K injection. It does go into the vastus lateralis or the thigh here, the thigh muscle. The other picture that you see here is what's called a heel stick. Um, reason that we do a heel stick would be to obtain a blood sugar at birth. Um, this could be because a physician has ordered it, uh, mama has a history of diabetes, or your baby is very jittery. We also do heel sticks in order to obtain any kind of lab work that we would need on the baby. Also at delivery, we give every baby a prophylactic treatment of erythromycin. It's an ophthalmic eye ointment. And basically, it's going to be placed in each eye. Um, babies are exposed to a lot as they come um, out during the, during the delivery. Some of these things can um, lead to infection, which can lead to blindness. And so, therefore, we prophylactically treat everyone. We will weigh the baby at birth. We also weigh the baby every night at midnight. Uh, just know it's very typical for babies to lose up to 10% of their body weight, whether they're breastfeeding or formula fed. Um, don't let that freak you out. Just keep on feeding. You're going to do just fine, mama, okay? Um, how you know your baby's getting enough is if your baby eventually starts gaining weight, your baby's having good amount of wet diapers and bowel movements every day, okay? The next thing I want to talk about related to the baby is the ID bracelets and some of our safety mechanisms that we have in place here at North Alabama Medical Center. So one of the things is we have ID bracelets and I'll show you a picture, a video here of what that might look like. So every baby gets an ID bracelet and as you can see here, it does have a number on that bracelet. So your baby will get a bracelet on their wrist and their ankle. You will also get a bracelet and then you get a bracelet of your choosing to give to whoever is your support person. So that's gonna be whoever is here helping you with the baby throughout the rest of your postpartum stay. Um, and so you would just need to let us know who that is so we can give that to them. Anytime you are picking up your baby or someone is dropping your baby off to you, please um, take a moment to be a part of that transfer, okay? So, um, help read out your bracelet to the nurse um, and vice versa. Very much engage in active listening as the nurse is reading those out to you. Um, so that way we ensure the safety of you and baby um, because we want those numbers to match to make sure that we're giving you the correct baby. And so please be an active part of that um, trade-off where we assess those numbers for you, okay? Um, only a person with the bracelet can pick up the baby from the nursery. And so, um, you know, if you gave the bracelet to your husband, but he had to go to work or your partner and they had to go to work and your mama wants to go down and pick up the baby, she will not be able to because she does not have the bracelet. Um, at discharge, we ensure that those bracelets match uh, to you and the footprint sheet. Um, and then we also give you a set that you can take home with you as well for your baby book. Before we move on to footprints, I just kind of want to review a little bit more about our security. We also have a security system in place um, for your baby. Your baby will also get a security tag that is placed around their ankle um, and it's held in place by a bracelet. That tag will alert us if it's ever cut off or nearing an exit for too long. It should not allow um, any baby to go out of a door or an elevator with that tag on. And so, um, it's very important to make sure that no one tampers with that or pulls on it um, because it will um, activate our alarms and we'll have to get a new tag. And so um, just know that that is in place. The other thing that we have is all of our nurses have a pink outline on their badge. 
and that just lets you know that we work on this floor, okay? Um, if there's anyone else that comes to pick up your baby and they don't have a pink outline on their badge, um, just pick up the phone and call nursery and say, hey, I'm just making sure that this person um, is supposed to be coming to get my baby because they did not have a pink badge on. Um, and that is just another safety mechanism that we have in place. Now, moving on to this slide, it's um, concerning footprints. We do obtain footprints immediately at delivery um, for our records. However, if you want footprints for your baby book, we will do those for you as well. Um, if you will just bring your baby book and let us know, uh, and we can get those done for you before you go home. Okay. All right, temperature. It is so, so, so important to maintain good thermoregulation for your baby. So after birth, we're gonna be monitoring the baby's temperature. Again, skin to skin contact. I cannot stress it enough. Bare baby skin to your bare skin. This is the best way to promote thermoregulation for your baby. Plus it is so sweet. It's such a wonderful bonding time. Um, so skin to skin is the way to go. And this is just a picture of someone doing skin to skin. So this baby is skin to skin on mama. However, she's still got that hat on and she still is covering the baby on the outside, okay? So as far as maintaining temperature for baby, other ways, again, skin to skin is best, but other ways you can is keeping the baby swaddled, uh, keep the baby's hat on and no excessive air conditioning. So you're not wanna have the baby next to the air conditioning where it's a continual draft not next to a window where it's nice and cold over there or not next to an open door either. Dads, you guys can do skin to skin too, okay? So any partner can do skin to skin. Um, it's such a wonderful bonding experience and I highly recommend it. Um, those of you that have to have a cesarean section, you know, dads, this is a great opportunity for you to do skin to skin while mama is still in surgery. Um, and so you can do skin to skin in the room until she comes out and then um, you can pass baby off to mama for skin to skin of her own and breastfeeding as well. All right, so swaddling, how do we do that? Okay, so you will need a swaddle blanket. All right, and make sure you bring um, your own from home so that um, you can wrap this over the baby whenever you guys leave in the car seat. So for the car seat, you wanna put the baby in, fold it in half and half again, and then place it over the baby like so. Do not swaddle the baby and then put them in the car seat, okay? But for the purposes of in the facility swaddling or at home, how you swaddle is you take your blanket and open it all the way up. So it's gonna be a nice big square. So you've got a nice big square and you wanna fold one corner down. So like that right there, okay? And then you're gonna to wanna to take that fold, okay? And you would be doing this on the bed or on, um, or in their crib, but for the purposes of demonstrating, I'm just gonna hold it right here. So we've got our fold, okay? And then you would wanna lay your baby. So we've got a shoulder line here. So lay your baby an inch below that fold line. So shoulder line an inch below the fold line here, okay? And then you're gonna take one side and we're gonna tuck their little arms and legs down in there. And you're gonna wrap one side all the way around and behind the baby here, okay? And then you're gonna take the bottom. So I'm gonna stand up so you can see. You're gonna take the bottom here and pull it up and over a shoulder here like that. And then you should have this one remaining side like this, okay? And so you would then take that one side and you're gonna wrap it around and behind the baby, like so, okay? So then you have a nicely swaddled baby. And for those of you that don't know, um, when they're newborns like this, they have no neck control, okay? So please make sure that when you're holding the baby, you're supporting the neck or the head or supporting it this way, okay? 
Um, so either way is fine. Just make sure you don't let that neck fall backwards, okay, or forward either way. Um, so support that head as you're holding the baby, um, swaddling, things of that nature. Okay, so that is a demonstration of swaddling. If you have any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to ask us, and we will be glad to do another demonstration for you again. Okay, so um, vernix. This is something that you might see on your baby. So this is the white cream cheese-like substance. Um, and this basically kind of serves as a protective skin covering for the fetus um, while the baby is in utero. And so um, the more preterm your baby is, the more vernix they may have. Um, please don't try to like scrub this off. This is great skin moisturizer for the baby. Just let it reabsorb. Um, some of it may come off when we're drying the baby or when we bathe the baby, uh, but for the most part, just leave it alone. Um, eventually, the skin will reabsorb it. All right, bathing. So typically, you want to do a sponge bath only while that cord stump is healing to prevent infection. You never want to submerge that baby underwater um, while that cord stump is still um, actively healing because you, you would run the risk of... Um, exposing that baby to infections that are in the water. And so again, just sponge bath only. You can see this picture here where they're just bathing with a sponge bath. You wanna clean the eyes and face first um, and then work your way down. Anytime you clean the genitalia, you need to make sure you use a different washcloth the next time and then scrub the baby's head. Uh, we will send a scrub brush home with you. Um, and so what you would want to do with that scrub brush Typically after I bathe them, I wrap them up in a swaddle blanket and then I wash their hair. Um, but that scrub brush, you would wanna go in a circular motion back and forth from side to side. Okay, and that will help to prevent cradle cap. Uh, baby lotion is okay to use if the skin is dry, but it's not usually recommended for repetitive use. Um, baby powder and oils are not recommended at all. Um, and anytime you're gonna wanna use essential oils or anything like that, you would really, really need to consult your pediatrician prior to doing anything of that nature. Um, but typically neither of those are recommended. All right, acrocyanosis we talked about already. That's just, again, that bluish grayish coloration of the hands and feet. And it's very common in the first 24 to 48 hours. And here's just a picture showing you what that might appear like in a baby. So you can see here the hands and the feet are a slight bluish grayish color. So for cord care, it's very important that you keep that cord nice and clean, uh, dry and exposed to air. Uh, typically that stump will fall off in about seven to 10 days. When you're putting on a diaper, you wanna make sure you fold that diaper so it's not continually rubbing across that cord area. Um, and before you go home, that cord clamp will be removed. So in hospital, you'll see this yellow cord clamp here. Uh, we actually will remove that, and the picture on the right is what it would look like after. Again, make sure you sponge bathe only until that stump falls off and heals. Um, if you notice any kind of signs of infection, so fever, uh, red streaking coming from this site, any kind of oozing or foul odor, please notify your pediatrician immediately of that. All right, so we're gonna move on to diapering. And so with diapering, uh, newborns need frequent diaper changes. Please do not leave them in a diaper that is wet or sold. It can cause a diaper rash. It's very important to keep it frequently changed out. Make sure you're cleaning all the folds. That bowel movement can get in places you didn't know existed. And so making sure that you are wiping everything down um, as far as little girls go, you want to make sure that you are wiping front to back, never the other way around. If you wipe the other way, it can introduce bacteria straight into the urethra and they can get a urinary tract infection. So you're going to wipe front to back, okay? And what I mean for that is, is going to be, hold on, this way. So front to back, okay? I don't have any wipes here with me, but um, as far as boys go, you want to make sure that um, you have a little protection. They can aim pretty far. And so when you're changing the diaper, maybe just lay a wipe right over that um, as you're changing. Um, and once you get the diaper on, make sure you point the penis down so that all the urine collects down here um, and doesn't just come out 
through the top of the diaper, okay? Um, for those of you who have never changed a diaper before, these little yellow tabs, um, they go in the back originally so that they can clasp in the front here, okay? So if you see that there. And you can also see how we've got this diaper folded down in the front to prevent it from rubbing against that umbilical cord side. The other thing about these diapers is they have a yellow line. You'll see that there, hopefully. And so that yellow indicator line is going to turn blue if it comes in contact with urine. And so um, if you ever see blue, go ahead and change it because we know there's urine in there somewhere. Um, a lot of times our nursery nurses will ask you to keep up with um, the diapers that you've changed throughout the day. And so if your baby has a bowel movement, if they're passing that meconium, it's going to be very thick, uh, black, and tarry. Sometimes you might not can tell if they've urinated also. So one good way of knowing that is you will also have a blue line. So then you can tell them they um, peed and had a bowel movement. Okay, so um, that is diaper changing. And so those are the different things you need to know about girls and boys. Um, also, diapers have these little ruffles. So if you'll make sure you, you pull those out, that's just a little extra protection barrier for any kind of leakage that may occur, okay? Um, don't make it too terribly tight where it cuts off circulation, but you also don't want it so loose that things are gonna come out. Just a good rule of thumb, if you can see in, it can come out, okay? So make sure you get it nice and snug so that things are not leaking. All right, so let's just talk about some normal newborn appearances. Um, babies are very just kind of quiet and alert. They might be looking around. This is a great time to breastfeed when they're like this, okay? So um, quiet and alert is the best time to breastfeed. Um, as they are passing through the pelvis, they might um, get what's called a molded head. Um, some, some of you may have heard it known as a cone head look. Um, and so that is okay. A lot of times that will significantly reduce um, over the next 24 hours. Um, and that is, again, just the molding so that they can fit through the pelvis. Um, if your baby was a cesarean section and never engaged in the pelvis, they might have an unmolded head. So this head is nice and round. Um, and so they wouldn't have that typical cone head look. Again, sometimes if they're in the pelvis for a while, they might be born with a puffy face. They can even be born with a bruised face as well. Um, and so just know that that could be an expected um, finding. Milia are these white little dots here. Um, we just encourage you guys to not pop those. Those are not pimples. Um, they will eventually go away. Mongolian spot is this bluish um, discoloration here. Uh, this is typically common on um, descendants of African American, Asian, Pacific Islander, or Hispanic descent. Um, it does often look like a bruise, um, and it will be on the lower uh, back, the buttocks, or the thighs. Um, and this will be documented in their chart. Lanugo hair is this fine, um, thin, downy-like hair that's covering the face. It can be on the shoulders, the back. Um, typically, if they're premature, they might have a little more Lanugo hair than, than others, um, but this will eventually shed off and go away. All right, and this last slide is, I really want you guys to ask questions. Just remember, you're not in this alone. We are all in this together. Um, if you are feeling unsure about something, ask a friend, ask someone on Facebook, call your pediatrician, call your OBGYN, call us even. We are here to help you and answer any kind of questions that you may have. Um, don't feel like you're in this alone. Feeling like you're in it alone can create feelings of depression, and postpartum depression is very real. Um, if you are feeling, you know, very fatigued, um, you know, not you're not sleeping as well, you don't really want to hold the baby anymore, you're not eating well, um, you're having thoughts of harming yourself or others, please, please, please seek out help and notify your OBGYN. That's very important um, to grab a hold of that and let's get that taken care of before it gets really bad um, because postpartum depression can be a very real thing. And so please seek out help if you need it. All right, so... I want you to just take one minute and write down one word that describes birth now, okay? 
Hopefully, your word is something a little more magical um, and positive. I have gotten words like magical. Um, I have gotten words like beautiful, uh, wonderful. And so basically, our goal in this childbirth class is to really just kind of help you to be a little less anxious about the process, knowing where to come, walk in through the door, hit button number three for the third floor and take a right when you get off the elevator. Just knowing where to come in general is going to reduce so much anxiety for you. Um, so I hope that you have found this um, online version of our childbirthing class um, beneficial. And um, this is just a picture of me and my daughter. This is actually an old picture. She was around 12 months in this picture. She's 19 months now. But soak it all in. I just cannot tell you how fast it goes. They are just precious and just an absolute joy to anyone's life. And so my suggestion to you is just soak up every single moment that you can with that precious little baby or babies, depending on if you're having twins, um, because it goes by so fast. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Please don't hesitate to ask us if you have any questions whatsoever, something you're just not feeling comfortable with. And, um, you know, we will be glad to assist you with that. And so congratulations. You are now ready to um, participate in your own childbirthing experience. So again, please let us know if we have any questions. And thank you so much for choosing um, North Alabama Medical Center for us to help assist you in the birth of your sweet, precious baby.